So I don't know, I'm going to introduce myself. Or Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me? Excuse me? I'll just stay there for a minute. How many uh, of you have doing spine, just spine kiss? Spine? <coughs> uh, anyone who's doing craniotomy, brain surgeries? Any ENT? Possible interventional procedures, boiling, parad, ENT. Anyone involved in a weak patient? Have you ever seen a weak surgery? Yes. On YouTube? <laughs> So I'm just going to start with uh, the scenario that there was a 23-year-old male patient uh, had a major blood related injury, uh, a burn, and he is in the war for corrective surgery. Patient uh, past medical history has no very healthy, no medical history, no hypertension, no diabetes. Uh, previous surgical history had a hand surgery, no no GI uh, anesthesia complications. So that's we are going through the when you have the OR, the patient come in, you're going through the history. Uh, no tobacco use, no alcohol use, uh, work in law enforcement, uh, and no allergy to work So patient was fully medicated, uh, GGD given dazepam, metazolam, in the pre-op, so patient had less stress on that, uh, and fed another 5, like 50 microgram in the pre-op. Patient was taken to operating room number 3, and monitor was set, oxygen set, uh, was set up. Uh, patient was induced with a propofol, uh, 200 milligram. Intubation was easy, no fiber optic session, very easy. A line was placed, bite block was placed. Neuromonitoring was set up for somatosensory work potential, motor work potential and EMG. Session was flipped on the patient uh, on the bed uh, and uh, continuous total intravenous anesthesia was given. Made the incision, no complication, dissection was done, and during decompression, uh, there was a guy or lady sitting in the corner. She said, I lost my cigarette. Okay. No, okay, we haven't started the case yet. <laughs> so what happened and what time? That can happen. How many times it happened to anyone of you? Have you seen the So what do you do at that time? Do you tell the surgeon first and the physiologist first or physician your IP? How many people will tell uh, talk with the surgeon first? How many people will talk to the, your interpreting physician? And how many will talk to the anesthesiologist? It's very split. Okay. So it's very difficult. Uh, it's not difficult, but so there's always a mechanism you follow. Then uh, have to do troubleshooting. The troubleshooting, unfortunately, we have not too many, uh, too much time to do troubleshooting because the changes they occur. It can be depending on what type of changes we have. It could be very uh, can have a us the resetting effect, or it, may not be. it could be technical issue, it could be non technical issue. So there are so many different variables, and you have like one or two minutes to make a decision. Is this your stimulator problem, is it a recording problem, is it an anesthesia problem, or is it a surgical problem, or any problem you have. Right. So, the reason, the reason you want to do very fast is the sensory system has a sense uh, white matter track and gray matter. White matter track is a little bit more resistance to changes, ischemic changes, compared to the gray matter. Gray matter is all synapses, the nuclear synapses, so they are very sensitive to ischemic changes. And the normal body temperature, if you have the literature says that if you have ischemia or within first two minutes, if it is reversed, you can have no or minimum reversible post-operative deficit. After two to four minutes, ischemia to the brain or spinal cord, it's an irreversible change. So if you wait for four minutes or more, and you have a loss of signal for more than four minutes, it may be irreversible change in your Compared to the, the white matter tract, which is nerves and axon, so the change can, up to 10 to 11 minutes, it can be a reversible change. If it's 11 to 20 minutes, which is a longer area, it's uh, <coughs> after 20 minutes, irreversible change. So that's why when you're doing SSAP for SSAP, for example, we keep doing until the last procedure. It takes 20 to 25 minutes to see a change in the peripheral nerves. So you have to do at least 25 minutes. That's a seen an exam person. What's the maximum time you wait? So we don't stop. You start closing, you don't stop shut down because it may take 20, 25 minutes to see the changes. And that would be, so you have to pick up the changes. So right now, I'm going to focus on the anesthesiologist. 
So in any type of surgery, uh, the patient is at risk of hypoxia, ischemia to the brain, it's called brain stem and spinal cord. That's why we want to, uh, all the guidelines, they tell us to monitor the peripheral nerve, the brain stem and the brain. So many times I see that, okay, this is a cervical case, I'm not monitoring the cause, or it's a lumbar case, I'm not monitoring lumbar uh, arch point. So that's, it can put you in a trouble because then if you don't have a peripheral response, it's very hard to differentiate. The problem is the stimulation, it's between the stimulation and the spinal cord, and between the spinal cord of brainstem or brainstem or of the brain. So that's why it's always, it's according to the guidelines, it's recommended to do all the recordings, depending, even you have a cervical case or lumbar case, it doesn't matter. <coughs> so the underst our understanding is to understand the physiology of the neurophysiological uh, physiology behind the IM, discuss how anesthesia interact with our signals and apply our knowledge of physiology to what we are working in the operating room. So just an uh, introduction so again. Uh, so. so neurophysiological monitoring is defined by American Society of Neurophysiological Monitoring as any measure which is taken to, to add to assess the functional integrity of a central nervous system or peripheral nervous system either in the operating room or any acute care setting. So when you talk about anyone uh, that, that I'm doing neuro, neuro monitoring or neurophysiology, when the term neurophysiology is used, it's a very broad term. It includes EKG or all the monitoring, all the body function monitoring. So I just typically split the neurophysiology into four. So <coughs> Diagnostic is the most common one. Everyone knows about diagnostics. So they're not diagnostic. They're using the same uh, modalities for diagnostic uh, diagnostic purpose. EMG or EEG or nerve protection. Uh, if the patient has uh, a stroke or multiple sclerosis or peripheral neuropathy or uh, hearing deficit, so they are sent to do different types. So those are diagnostic. So we do the evoke prevention. We can do preoperatively or uh, in the clinical level. Prognostic, the same test, they can be used for prognosis. You can go to ICU and use the evoke potential or EM, uh, uh, auditory evoke potential, visual evoke potential, uh, EEG to see the patient is getting better or worse. So patient has a myocardial infarction or a, a stroke or any other disease, patient is ICU intubated, you want to see is patient, so you can predict the outcome by looking at the waveform. Uh, you do the brain death study also, if you have a response, uh, you do every six hours and it used to do, I uh, used to do an ICU, so you go to ICU and the patient, we do every six hour brain stem auditory go potential and medium of SSCP. And typically, this patient, they have no particular SSCP or, or, or if, uh, if, but once you lose the brain stem responses, then you have to, you can disconnect the patient because you don't, that's mean the patient breaks. So you look for the loss of brain stem responses in those conditions. Those are uh, patient in the coma, either they're induced coma or they're, you know. so all my technologists, I tell them, to, just make sure your stimulator is working. So don't go home and say, oh my God, the stimulator is So therapeutic, so the neurophysiology can be used in therapeutic purpose. So the therapeutic purpose, use of neurophysiology is like deep stimulation for Parkinson, dystonia, tremor, obesity, OCD. Uh, we have focus ultrasound, so focal ultrasound is used for, for treatment of stroke, or high beam. So the last one, we are focusing on interoperative neurophysiology. So the purpose of interoperative monitoring is to, to, uh, to reduce or minimize hydrogenic injury, any injury occurring in the OR, and to improve the patient outcome and patient neurological deficit, between the deficit. So the three main the benefit of doing is increased safety of the patient. We can increase the safety of the patient. We can accommodate more complex cases. So if you, if, if you are in the, the surgeon is working in a hospital and you, the, uh, the neuro monitoring department, they can do brain stem monitoring or they can do cranial monitoring, they don't, they don't have to refer that patient to another hospital, they can afford it more, and then decrease the adverse effect of that. So there are multiple surgeries, uh, uh, you can do the application, so you have multiple modalities, so all of you are aware of those modalities, so I don't want to go into detail. Uh, so, but all the modalities, they have uh, negative and uh, pro and cons. So, but there's not a single uh, modality we use on any case of spine case or brain case and circuit test enough. So that's why to give the maximum protection to the patient, we have to focus on multi-modality monitoring. And that's 
sometime I talk, talk to the surgeon and say, you don't need EMG or I don't need SLP. So, so the, what, as, uh, I'm just talking about saying that you have to educate the surgeon because uh, one time I said, okay, I was talking to the surgeon and so he said, no, I don't want a, a motor for this case. I said, why don't you want, why don't you want motor? The motors are more important. And he said, okay, so okay, no. And I told him, I'm not going to make more money because the surgeon was saying that, okay, more modality is going to do, like you're going to make more money, that's why you So it's not making more money, so it's because you are giving more protection. I said, okay, if I do just EMG, I will make the same money. I can yeah. I'll go home, I'll be like, I'm putting more recovery, I'm doing more work because you need more feedback and the surgeon, uh, the patient needs more that. So when we are <coughs> recording in the OR, so the responses, either we can, uh, the patient have surgical nerve injury due to detraction, indication, direct injury or indirect injury. Uh, it could be anesthesia, uh, management, uh, agent, anesthetic agent, and then technically, uh, electrode placement, stimulation, recording. So this is one of the paper published in the very old paper. So in spawn cord monitoring, documented reduction in the injury rate from 0.7 to 4% in pre-SSV monitoring is to less than 0.5. So that's one. They compare the data and they say it was 0.7 to 4%, <coughs> but now it's less than 5%, just adding SSV to the... For auditory work potential, pre-interoperative monitoring in early 70s, in U.S., people were for a patient going to uh, surgery for a caustic neuroma or with a uh, patient of tumor, they were waking up with 38 to 80 percent hearing deficit. So, with even the high speed surgeon, all the equipment have 40 percent patient, patient have post operative hearing deficit. We moved uh, the auditory clinical testing into the OR. It decreased in 1974, 73, 74, from 38 percent to less than one percent. So hearing deficit just using, um, you don't have to lose the AVR or artery bone potential to have a hearing deficit. So even there's a delay, sustained delay for two, a millisecond, uh, for a longer time, the patient will wake up with a hearing deficit. So it's very good correlation. So uh, for talking, so those documentation and literature is very important when we are talking. So we cannot just go and talk to the surgeon and say, okay. Um, SSAP. Uh, <coughs> So when you're talking about SSAP, you're doing SSAP every day. It's always important to know what is SSAP, what are pathways. Uh, if I give you a quiz right now, how many people can draw SSAP pathway? Can you raise your hand? Some people do first history. Do you know how many neurons in the, from stimulation side to recording side? How many neurons are involved in SSAP? Three, yes, three. What are the names? Uh, first degree neuron, neuron and yeah. then second. Yeah. Yeah. Very easy. Anatomy is the easiest thing. First degree, second degree is the, but it's uh, very volatile. So it's very easy to understand. It's this is superior, this is inferior, this is lateral medial, but you forget it's very volatile. It's just like alcohol. So you don't use it again and again. So it goes. So why I'm asking that because you're doing SSP every day. But if you don't know the pathway, where the synapses from the uh, where's the first stimulation from the stimulation side to the nucleus cuneatus, that's your upper SSAP, the first pathway. And nucleus cuneatus, the thalamus cross over the second order neuron from thalamus to the uh, to the cortex, your third order neuron. So all these synapses, where are those synapses, and where the surgeon is working? Surgeon working in, on the near brain stem, or they're working in the thalamus, or they're working below that. So that will help you. How anesthesia works? So anything, anesthesia, when you give the anesthesia, we are giving either inhalational or intravenous. It goes and blocks those synapses. So the more synapses you have, more signal will affect. So that's why cortical, assist, cortical new, uh, responses have one, two, two and three, three synapses. So those are affected more than subcorticals. Subcortical has only one response. So that's the uh, last one to go. And, and the earth's point of the porphosa has no synapses, so you never go away. <coughs> So knowing the pathway will help you where the anesthesia is going to affect and what you do. Motor evoke potential, uh, can you draw a pathway for motor? Anyone can draw a motor pathway. Yeah. Uh, just one, two. <laughs> okay. Uh, you need a wake-up test. Maybe direct cortical stimulation. 
there are, upper, there are only two neurons, upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. Upper motor neurons run from uh, from the stimulation side, it go to the lower motor neuron, make a synapse in the spinal cord, and cross and comes. Lower motor neurons run from the spinal cord to the muscle. So when you have anesthesia, it's going to affect your, uh, it will block your MEP on the brain or, <coughs> or spinal cord. So when you, if you have increased yeah. anesthesia, it's going to affect your MEP, correct? You lose your MEP. Yeah. So who is, uh, so the loss of MEP is effect of anesthesia on the brain or spinal cord? Spinal cord. Why spinal cord? Because it affects oh, the anterior, anterior horn cell. Correct. So the anterior horn cell is the junction of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So when you're stimulating, if you increase the stimulation, sometimes people keep going stimulating up and up and up and patient is jumping two feet and I have no response to that. So I have a patient, I was patient have a scoliosis, tethered cord, cerebral palsy, and I was stimulating at 860 volt and patient was jumping like two feet and I can say, Oh you have good MEP, I said, No, I don't have <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can see the patient moving. It's not me, it's the computer. <laughs> so the anesthesia, because when you stimulate higher, so the stimulation current is bypassing the interneurons on the brain, so you can bypass those neurons, and it has the effect on the particle neuron, but you can bypass the increase stimulation, but you cannot bypass the spinal cord. So it has, it blocks the season there. EEG is the, so I'm just going to the model, modalities which uh, we're doing, and then so, the function of EEG, what we do is to check the cortical ischemia, either that is manipulation or we can do as a second effect. Burst suppression, so if you're recording the burst suppression and the CCR cortical protection. Uh, anyone have done ICU monitoring here, EEG? One? Do you do, how many people do EEG monitoring in the world? EEG. What are you, why are you monitoring EEG? So, so in some cases, like um, aneurysm clipping, uh, so you can put the patient in the burst operation. Mm -hmm. So, if you clip the arteries mis by mistake, wrong artery, the patient can, the brain can survive for a very long time if the patient uh, is in burst operation because the patient is not requiring demand, the demand is decreased. Uh, cardiac bypass, so in cardiac bypass, you have to decrease the body temperature to 17 degrees or 16 degrees centigrade. You have to put the brain with the ice pack uh, and there's a flat EEG. So when you're doing something like that, you have to increase your window to 5 minutes or 10 minutes. So you cannot have like 2 minutes or 1 minute or 3 minutes because you see a burst, 1 burst per minute. If it's a 1 burst every 10 minutes, you cannot tell unless you have a 10 minute window so you can see that. So EEG, so EEG has a pattern, so there are four waveforms, correct, everyone? There. Mm -hmm. Do you know the name of the EEG waveform? Theta, 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 beta. So the f if you are awake and your eyes are open, you get a beta activity, which is 13 to 30 activity. Um, you, if you close your eyes, you lose beta activity, you will go to the alpha activity. If you close your eyes and you have a beta activity, there are two scenarios, correct, which are? Either you have some problem in the brain, there's a first a tumor or some structure, or the second is you're in drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so all the narcotics they increase the beta activity, they increase the function. So that's why patient is very, very deep and you see beta activity in the in your EEG, that's mean that's propofol. Propofol causes beta activity in the world. But that beta activity is present in all the channels, so it's not going to be focus on your, uh, on your occipital nerve or front view. So you see all the BTs so you can tell because And if you go to sleep, then you go to the alpha activity and if you very, very deep perception, you'll get delta activity. I'm feeling some delta and theta here, so okay. Maybe that's <laughs> beta activity. Uh, so you have beta, alphas, and then you go to sinus. Sinus is not good. Electrocardiography, we put the same recording from the cortex directly. Go to electrocardiography, you can see some spikes here. You can put the grid, uh, you can put 1 by 4, 2 by 4, you can, you can monitor the severe so the patient presentation. This is one of the electrocardiograms. So, 
Uh, we are doing like direct particle stimulation. You can see the stimulation artifact. We have patient uh, nothing. Second stimulation artifact, patient starts seizing and uh, and then getting convulsion. So seizing is when the brain is you know, spikes, but patient is not physically moving. When patient starts physically moving, then you have convulsion. So then you can see all the muscle activity also. And so it was less than 17 seconds from the identification to the induction of propofol bolus. And then it slows down and patient and goes to patient. The bad thing about that is you cannot do any electrophotography after that. So we try to use an isoline. Isoline is a slushy slime, which is uh, out of the brain. And before it spread to the other part, if it's spread to the other part uh, beyond your exposed area, then you have to do intravenous. So anesthesia, um, so why we should care about anesthesia? It's not our job, right? It's anesthesia job. But why we care about anesthesia? Because we want to obtain signal. We want to have an adequate signal. And we have, want to have good signal to noise ratio. We want to have a reducible signal. We don't want to see a signal every 15 minutes. We want to have a minimal variance between signals. Uh, we want to be able to interpret the data accurately. Uh, convey our correct information. So we have reasons to be get involved in this as well. Um, so there are four uh, mm -hmm. journal anesthesia. So you have the types of journal anesthesia. We do anesthesia, <coughs> anesthesia, anesthesia, sedation, amnesia, muscle relaxation. Uh, so what is analgesia? Analgesia is loss of energy, brain or some mm -hmm. So any effect of anesthesia. So there's not, every drug has some good some medications are some. That's why they change the CO or DES or nitrous because some of them are good analgesic, some are good amnesic, so whatever they want. Sedation, so they want to sed uh, sedate the patient, um, which is loss of consciousness and reduction of sleep. Uh, amnesia, you don't want patient waking up and remember all the talk you had with the surgeon, correct? Mm -hmm. Muscle resection, loss of movement, so those are different categories and then have so as an anesthesiologist, it's always good to know like what anesthesiologists are doing. So they have four phases of planning anesthesia. The first is formation or pre-op. It's called formation. It's a pre-op. So all the preparation and talk to the patient and giving the medicinum or desipam in the pre-op area. Then uh, another is preparation in the pre-op, giving IV or something. Uh, interaction in interop, so bringing the patient to OR, OR and interaction, there's an interaction phase and completion phase is interoperated when patient is induced, there's a completion at the end of the day. So those are the four phases of the anesthesia protocol. It's always uh, good to know how the machine looks like, okay, so if you work in the OR and what are the different numbers in the uh, So we have pulse, pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, uh, here, and then we have temperature. Oh, how often do you monitor, uh, record, document? What is your protocol to document anesthesia? Mm -hmm. 30 minutes? 30 minutes? 30. Oh. 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> lowest one, who has the lowest number? 20. 20, less than 20? 15, anybody less than 15 here? Going once, going twice, any less? No? It's changing. Less is changing. No, nobody less, Leah? No, 10 minutes? No? All the change. Change. What? Okay. 30 is the longest one, okay? So, and this. <laughs> So what do you monitor when you're when you're document and see what are you documenting? Yes. Louder? No. That's the toughest part. I can speak for twenty hours but not loud. <laughs> So what do you document when you're document anesthesia? Map. Map. Anything else? Temperature. Temperature. Infusion. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Heart rate. 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 Heart r
So you have uh, into, so have you seen this pump? In the, yeah. So all the pumps they have different drugs going on. So yeah, sometimes you have lidocaine, you have uh, propofol, you have some other anesthetic agent, uh, dexamethasone. So it's always good to know which which medicine is which one when you document, so you're not mixing up the numbers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so base monitor is a two-channel EEG. It's a proprietary number, so nobody knows what's going on behind those uh, strips. So it's a two-channel frontal EEG. So the bad thing is it's monitoring only frontal EEG. It's not monitoring your occipital lobe or temporal lobe or parietal lobe. But it gives you a number. Number output is from 0 to 100. 0 is uh, 100 is patient is awake, fully awake, and and zero means patient's dead, so, uh, <laughs> so it's that thing. So and 40 to 60 is the typical number where the anesthesiologists like to keep the patient uh, uh, for the operating. But it, I, I don't know if you have seen that, sometimes you see uh, zero and patient is walking and talking and sometimes it's 100 and patient is not moving for hours. So it fluctuates So and it gives you a, a very bad artifact in your EEG or sometimes SSCP. So if you're getting a lot of 60 hertz noise or noise, so that could be one factor this strip and even it's turned off but it's plugged in it will still give you 60 hertz noise. Uh, entropy, uh, do you monitor entropy? Have you seen entropy? So entropy is another number so I give you two numbers there RE and SE. So RE is uh, response entropy and SE is state entropy and it also adds EEG, EMG and SSCP. So uh, sorry EMG and EEG. Uh, this monitor is just two general EEG uh, entropy is a combination of the uh, frontal uh, frontalis muscle EMG and EEG. So if the patient is paralyzed, then it will have a lower number. <coughs> uh, twitch monitor, I guess you have seen that. Yes. Uh, <coughs> how many of you monitor your own trainer for? How many rely on anesthesia trainer for? How many? Of <laughs> so, so train this this machine is a, like more than billion sold so far. So it can do four different type of tests: single twitch, tetanic stimulation, train of force stimulation, and post uh, tetanic stimulation. Um, so I'm not going to go to billing, but when you are doing train of four, the train of four for the when we do interoperative monitoring, if you select train of four, that is not this train of four. Train of four refers according to the guidelines uh, or the billing is the titanic stimulation, which we don't do it. So we cannot use train of four stimulation. But uh, all of them have a different, with a single pulse stimulation, you need to have a baseline and you compare a single pulse throughout the case. Uh, the titanic, you do like very high frequency stimulation to see patient go to tetany or not. Uh, post tetanic, you do tetany and then you post tetany. Train of four, you have four stimulation at the same time. Uh, Dr. Ruchas will talk more in detail, but uh, you don't have to compare. So you can do train of four any time during the surgery, and you can say, okay, patient, how much is better than So you don't need to have baseline. Anesthesia agents are two types of anesthesia agent. Uh, we have inundation agent and in injectable agent. <coughs> so the inundation agent, they are inspired the patient, and they're giving in percentage, and is. Uh, it's documented as MAG, minimal angular concentration. So the minimum MAG, at one MAG, 50% uh, patient will not move. The definition of one MAG of any rec is like at one MAG of any anesthetic agent, if you make an incision or give a painful stimuli, 50% patient will not move. Do you know at what MAG, at what MAG level, 95% patient will not move? 1.3. Yes. 1. 1.2. Yes, you have seen them in So the typical one uses uh, right now is isoflurane, uh, seoflurane, desflurane, nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a very quick, so you go to dentist office or quick, so they use nitrous oxide, laughing gas, you go in and how it goes to be. Seoflurane, isoflurane is the longest acting, it's the, it takes much longer time, and so that's why it's very uncommon to induce a patient with isoflurane. It will be uh, in 1970s, it was chloroform, so it was just choking the patient and they were sitting on the chair. <laughs> they were screaming and people are holding with chloroform. And, and then they wake up, they were telling every single 
their private information. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why they have HIPAA. The <laughs> so injectable agent, we, we, uh, we can give in bolus and uh, continuous infection. Now we have TCI. Do you document? Have you seen TCI? Targeted control infusion. So it's not a control, it's not a bolus, but it's an automatic pump. So it's me measuring the level and it give bolus after like 30 minutes or 15 minutes, random, it's automatic. So you are, you are not controlling that. So, so sometimes you go and they are not using confusion and they are not giving bolus, so they are in TCI. And that will have a very different type of factor of your signal because suddenly there's a bolus given. You have no idea of giving it 30 minutes or 45 minutes. So it's not need to know they are giving a bolus infusion or TCI. So typical uh, anesthesia, propofol, thiopentol, ketamine, and narcotics, fentanyl, sufentanyl, fentanyl, and possible So the, uh, all the anesthesia, we have fact of cortical SSP, motor evoke potential, EMG, and EEG, different type of EM, uh, effect. The SSP is, has effect by increasing the amplitude and increasing the latency, and most of the agent will increase latency and decrease. Uh, the subcortical again, because there's only one synapse is the last one. Uh, the motor evoke potential, uh, they are affected mostly in spinal cord, but you have changes in brain and, and the skeletal muscle because of the muscle relaxant. So train of four, this is the most important because uh, many, many people, they have a misconception that we have one, you lose, you have four by four, that means uh, you have, uh, you have three, but you lose one twitch, you lose 25% and 50% 75%. It's not, if you lose one twitch, you lose 65 to 70% muscle. So, and you lose two twitches, you lose 85% of muscle. And you have three twitches, you have 95. So, 75, 85, 95, it's not 25, 50. So, here, so that's why we need to have like four twitches. If you have three twitches, you have loss of 75% muscle, so you cannot even monitor it. Uh, when you do a motor evoke potential, do you know how much, how many, uh, what percentage of muscle fiber we are monitoring? Yeah, 5% 5 of the So when you do MEP, you cannot monitor more, monitor more than 5%. We can recruit only 5% of the fibers. And, and why is that? Uh, what, what percentage of fibers, motor fiber, originate from the motor products? 100% of anyone for 150%. Mm -hmm. So when you stimulate the brain or the motor pathway, what percentage of the motor fibers originate from the motor products? You need beta. Mm -hmm. activity. 60? Yeah. Uh, how about the remaining 40%? Mm -hmm. That's also motor. Okay. Ah. But you are close. So, yeah, motor cortex, yeah, 33%. One third of fiber, they originate from primary motor gyrus, pre motor, uh, pre central gyrus. One third originate from pre, uh, pre motor area, and 33% originate from sensory cortex. 33% of fiber they are coming from. So when you screw on C3, C4, you are, activated, you are on 33% of the fiber. And if you don't measure the head and you just put randomly, how many people measure the head every day, every patient? One, two, two, three. What was the question for? How Imagine. many of you measure the head before you measure the head? Yeah, just four. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a surgeon putting a like, uh, screw without C on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yes. With x ray, right? X ray before, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but that would be like an anomaly. So they have, they're putting a screw, they, they can say I have put like thousand screws in the last two years and I don't need to use C on. I can, I know this is L4. Or <laughs> well, they're taking a brain tumor out, it's okay, I don't need navigation. I'm going to eyeball and just take the tumor out here. There. So, but what, so we are putting the electrode. So if you're doing SSAP, you put electrode any place on the head, you'll get something because signal is produced. It not, may not be the right signal. It may be upside down because phase works or something. So you, you will interpret everything wrong. Uh, motor evoke potential, if you're too far, you're not going to get anything. What happens is you have to increase the stimulation until the current reaches the, your motor cortex. And at that time, the patient is jumping up the bed and such so says, stop stimulating. Don't stimulate until I tell you. And they don't tell you, they f after that they forget. And they say, oh, really? Okay. Just take a base, another, I'm closing. So if you measure the head and you put the appropriately, you can get a very good MEP with less than 200 volts and patient is not going to move. 
you can do a motors throughout the surgery like the recommended we, so, like I said do it like every two minutes because when we published a paper we lost MEP within one minute or 50 seconds we had MEP we lost one minute 50 seconds and we did we took out every we had six screws we took out the screws patient uh, we did wake up test patient didn't move one like uh, one that gave blood pressure and the blood pressure gave uh, steroid post operatively patient was not moving the leg I see and took out everything uh, again but within 48 uh, 24 hours patient started moving have flexors within three days she was walking and 16 year old and after one week she was running so she was all big but because so I, because the changes we picked was within <coughs> three minutes if it was like a 10 minute that was permanent damage patient like, yes <coughs> when, when you're doing MEPs how high <laughs> voltage when you go? Will you go up till you get some or will you go up to like 200 and stop? You go to, you get something. But the point is like... One of the doctors that reads for us yeah. has said that anything over 200 volts is not really MPs. What is I, that? I don't know. <laughs> that, that should be the next question. So if I tell you something, keep asking like why. So we need to have like a good... So if I'm telling you and I cannot do response, then it's not... So if they so not MEP, it's not MEP. Yeah, but if you are, so there's something which is which cannot be auditory or visual or something, correct? It's, it's, the only thing you can say if you are in a brain tumor, brain surgery, if you go very high, you can bypass the tumor side and you get a false positive or a false negative. Yeah. So that's why, it's, but if you are spine case, you can go to 1000 volt, you are not going to go to... Well, that's why I agree. But for brain, so we don't recommend doing motor evoke potential for any supratentorial tumor, cortical tumor, because you do transdrain motors, it's going to bypass. You take the whole brain out, you'll still have good MEP. So transcranial, uh, supratentorial above the corpus callosum, never do any transcranial MEP. If surgeon force you to do that, document that. If surgeon doesn't form, you have a very risk of false negative. You have to do transcranial direct motor for that, because there's more for that. I'm sorry guys, I have 60 slides left and I have five more. <laughs> so muscle relaxation, so we have two major categories, depolarization, uh, depolarizer and non-depolarizer. Uh, depolarizer is sexy like pulling and all the other are non-depolarizer. The difference between depolarizer and non-depolarizer is that uh, depolarizers depolarize the neuromuscular junction. So the so, so when you send a stimulation, you want to contract, it's not going to do contraction. The non-depolarizer is going to be completed. <coughs> So succinyl alkylene has a phase one block. It decreases the single twitch, uh, low fade, and turn of fold ratio uh, can be more than 0.7, and it causes facilitation. And it has phase two block, which is uh, not depolarizer. So when you get muscle relaxant, so face is the first one to get paralyzed. Anyone agrees with me or disagree? So when you do train the four, do you do from face, hand or foot? Foot. 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 If it is a cervical case, do you do from foot or hand? Foot. I use a cervical foot. So why you do from foot? The last one. The last one. So last one to paralyze or recover? To recover. So last one to paralyze and recover. Why is that? Correct. Blood flow. So blood flow. So all the muscles which have high blood flow will be paralyzed because you inject the muscle like that. It grows. The heart is pumping every second. So one hertz pump like 70 beats per minute. So your face is very vascular. Facial, facial artery supplying is very small. So face is the first one to get paralyzed. The hand is bigger muscles and but more less blood supply. And the legs are like there's no exit. So the big highway is going on there. So it takes much longer time to paralyze feet. And same thing for the flow, it takes much longer to reverse that. So if you have a four twitches in foot, that means all the other. But you can attempt about foot if you have four twitches in hand. You can have four for four in hand, you can have zero in foot. So you have to make sure. And then the serology they always do from face. And when they do from face, uh, no offense, somebody in the serology say, but but when you're doing face, so they put the uh, stimulator, I don't know if you've seen, they put on the muscles, they don't even stimulate the nerve here. They stimulate the muscles that they bypass. Okay. So I don't know. But why we need to give muscle accent? Because they need to have anti adequate intubation, they have adequate surgical exposure, and through the mechanical, uh, we talk about that surgical visit. 
So the muscle relaxation, when you have now more than 90% muscle paralyzed, that's a stage of surgical relaxation. When you have, uh, sorry, more than 95%, that's intubation facilitated, and total flaccid is 99% at that point. So this is just an example of, we can talk more in, uh, in the breakout session. So if I kept at 40, 45 milli, uh, milliampere, so I have train of four like this one, first rate bigger, smaller, and then it, after two hours, it was getting bigger and bigger. So when you're running train of four, you can also run EMG, so you know you are doing the train of four from the correct muscle, so you're getting the artifact. If you stimulate the left hand and look at that, you're getting the spot from the left hand, but in right foot, so you should get the EMG from the right foot, so just make sure it's a troubleshooting. Um, so getting a train of four to 25 million pair or 75 million doesn't matter. Uh, it matters because we cannot tell the difference between 0% per 5% uh, paralysis and 75% paralysis. Both have one loss of one trait. So how you cover that by increasing the stimulation. So if you're getting response, if you stimulate the direct nerve, what's the threshold of direct nerve? Less than one Less than one to one right? So and, and when you do train of four, what's your threshold for train of four? Typical. Do you do train of four? How high do you stimulate? 70. Yeah. So you stimulate 70, you're supposed to be one so, uh, to the skin. So you should not get, if you do an awake patient, you should get less than 10 million pair. Yeah. Try. Yeah. And try less than 10. So you go to that. If you have to go to 20, 30, 40, 50 to get a response, that means something is going on, correct? Mm -hmm. So then that's the partial paralysis. It doesn't help. So you need to give you a false positive and false negative. The challenges we have is technical challenges, stimulation problem, we can get a record <coughs> and the CGI temperature, and physiologically we get temperature, mean or pressure, conditioning issues, and then we have surgical issue. The uh, intracranial pressure, so increase in intracranial pressure will affect change in uh, your uh, the signal. So every time, so all the craniotomy, when you bring chronic, they're monitoring ICP, but all crani, they don't monitor ICP. So for ICP, so it will decrease the amplitude. So the typical intracranial pressure should be less than 10 millimeter, millimeter mercury. But sometimes you can see 70, 80, 90, 100. It's more than 100. They have to do the shot. To go for the shot. But ICP has better. So if you have many, uh, and same thing for uh, CO2. CO2 can cause hypocapnia and hypercapnia. How many monitor CO2 every time? Just one. Access. Yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> so CO2, because many times you say, okay, yeah, you, you lose your signal and certain, uh, you go to the sleep, the certain say, I'm not doing anything, I'm just exposing, and you go to the sleep, they say, I cannot change anything, the infusion rate is same, or the gas is same, I'm not given muscle less than the minimum, blood pressure is not changed, and then you're wondering what happened. So look at the CO2 level, because CO2 has to be between 25 and 40. So if it is less than 25 millimeter, then you're hypocapnia. If it's more than 40, you are hypercapnia. If it is, uh, it is hypocap it's a hypocapnia, it will cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction will affect less blood flow. Less blood flow, ischemia, you have less SSP and change. If you're more than 40 millimeter, the blood vessel will dilate to get, uh, so it has hypo, uh, hypercapnia. And hypercapnia also causes, what happens is hypocap uh, hypercapnia, there's a vasodilation. And vasodilation will have pooling of the blood in the, in the brain. And when you're doing MEP, the current will shunt to the blood. It's not going to go deep, so the blood is going to get loose. So you're doing, you have to go higher and higher. The current is going from scalp to scalp to scalp. It's not going to activate really. So, <coughs> you keep, so next time you keep eye on M CO2 and you change the CO2, you get a very good uh, So TCMP are affected by uh, opioids. Opioid cause mild changes, they decrease amplitude and increase latency. Effect are that reversed by the naloxone. Naloxone is anti uh, infusion, have less uh, effect than the bolus effect. So, ketamine affect your SSCP, so it has a positive effect, but it has a post operative uh, hallucinations. Uh, so, that's why I really good uh, use. But if you drink ketamine, then you are lucky, so you get very good signal. So, that it increases amplitude or atomic rate. But because of side effect, you don't use that. Thiopental, they also sometimes they give you, especially if you're doing carotid cases. But thiopental is 
if you're doing carotid and you know, EEG monitoring, make sure you talk to them, don't give a thyroid bonus. They always give an injection with thyroid not always, many times they give a thyroid pentol. But the entire pentol, you have no EEG for the surgery. Um, benzodiazep benzodiazepines also have mild effects, so they are giving fusion, you're okay, but every time they're giving a bolus or, a, or something, just keep an eye. It has effect on your attitude also. Uh, Medazolam, initially it increases the latency and decreases the amplitude, uh, but it, over the next half an hour it resolves and go to baseline. And again, the subcortical responses are minimal factors to affect more than uh, local anesthesia, abolish remote potential. And, uh, uh, so if you're doing local anesthesia, so make sure if you're doing uh, five blood intubation, if you're using endotracheal tube, there's no local anesthesia placed on that, it will not like the muscle. If they're doing a uh, 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 just final uh, subdural uh, epidural anesthesia. So sometimes they do epidural anesthesia before that, uh, before the surgery starts. They have to do before the surgery. So make sure that, and that epidural is done uh, to to give the pain, uh, lidocaine or pain medicine post-operatively. So <coughs> it's done, but they do intraoperatively. So so if, if you see they are doing uh, epidural anesthesia, tell them uh, talk to the anesthesia. Don't give lidocaine during the surgery, wait until you do the last traces and then because if you give a lidocaine or any uh, any uh, anesthetic agent, epidural, you lose everything because the nerves will be blocked, so you don't have any signal. So if you have a change in neuromotoring, what we should do? So the f there's a, uh, everyone is using 50% decrease, you're using 50% decrease amplitude, but you use about 10%. And please let us see. So, if you have a change of 45 percent, what do you do? You wait for 50 percent, or what do you do? Start troubleshooting my stuff. Okay. Do you tell the surgeon or somebody? Not yet. Say, so you wait for. 50%. I mean, I notify the neurologist, but. Okay. At 45 percent. Yeah. If I see. How about 40 percent? Yeah. If I see. 35. Like <laughs> 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 35 percent. So that 50 percent. <coughs> um. What's your criteria? I guess about 30% change in like one limb, I'll start checking patient yeah. positioning and anesthesia and stuff. So, so, you do, so you are doing 30% change? I started looking so you at wait for my stuff. So you wait for 30% change and then you can... I guess around is more than I might say, maybe, <laughs> morphology <laughs> change. And you had 25% change there? Uh, I don't recall. So, that is, so, so the first meeting of the interpretive haunting Dr. Morera is... So you can tell you, 1977, the first time the group of people, they voted Dr. Nash, Brown, and uh, so they all came together, so okay, we should do monitoring, and some were, so what should be the criteria for SSP? There was no MEP, it's okay, okay, that's 50% change, that's good enough, and 10% is latency. Mm -hmm. So since the last 40 years, there's not one paper published which says the 50% change is a big change. Mm -hmm. is correlated with the post-operative deficit. It's just a random picked up number and nobody has done any study. So you are welcome to do any study and do that. So that's a random. So you can have a 30% do so so don't wait for 50% changes. I've seen people they just wait. It's 40% not 50%. But if you're sudden change and you have everything and there's a 25% change, something is wrong. So you have to troubleshoot and do what's the reason about that. So you don't have it's ten percent increase latency or eight percent and you're just sitting there it's two more percent. <coughs> So isof again, the effect of isofen is one of the uh, paper from Dr. McDonald's old paper. So you increase the isofen half mag, you have good SSP one mag, it will get worse, and after 1.2 mag, you lose your isofen. So you have to make sure you have less. So nitrous uh, oxide, uh, uh, the one mag of nitrous oxide is 104 percent. But can you give 104 percent to anyone? No. Why not? <laughs> so the maximum you can give. And that's the person again. Seventy percent, seventy percent. If you give more than seventy percent nitrous, then you have uh, uh, brain death. So, you, so the half mag of sixty, sixty-five percent. If it is only nitrous, you can get a very good signal with the half mag. But if you are doing nitrous plus any gas, then it will be destroyed because you talk to say, yes, okay, nitrous does not affect. I've done nitrous before; it's not going to affect the signal. But it's only when nitrous is used alone. When nitrous is used alone, then then it's okay to have mag, but if you're using with isoflurane, then uh, uh, you know what's the one mag value of desflurane? Six percent. 
So what is remaining 94 percent? Yes, oxygen. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Opioids. Okay, some again. Uh, Remifentanil, fentanyl can reduce temperature. Uh, rem uh, Remifentanil, your high doses has no effect. So when fentanyl, so fentanyl, alpha fentanyl, they can induce your temperature, but remifentanil doesn't affect. Even in high doses. IV propofol, it has dose dependent decrease in amplitude, so it's a very long case. You'll see more changes, in especially more repo potential in a longer case at the end. Uh, so, again, the, uh, mentioned before, barbiturate and brazodiazepine, they have mild depression on SSP, but they have a quick recovery, so you have dep initial depression followed by the stability phase. Ketamine, ketamine again, increased the SSP. Uh, atomic rate increased the, uh, your signal amplitude. Uh, droperidol is an anti dopaminergic drug and it is given for uh, NS, uh, nausea uh, and also sometimes it uses a sedative but it has minimal effect so it has more effect on if you're doing uh, EKG and Q and Toggle. Presidex, it has uh, minimal effect but uh, if you're doing a motor go potential it also has some effect on, on the decrease in amplitude of Presidex. Uh, this is one of the uh, slide from paper, so changes in Presidex in muscle. Mm -hmm. So, so when you're doing multiple muscles, so if you have uh, you're doing a uh, lumbar case or thoracic case, and you're recording for quadriceps, like a foot muscle, and you lose quadriceps, do you, do you do anything? Do you do anything, or you just wait? That's okay. You wait for the, the foot. If the foot muscle is okay, but then leg is gone. What? So when you're doing troubleshooting, if you're doing motor evoke potential and you're doing multiple muscles, quadriceps, leg and foot, tibialis anterior and foot muscle, and you lose quadriceps but you have good tibialis anterior and good foot muscle, is it okay to keep moving out here to stop the surgery and do something? What's the surgery? Level of surgery is uh, T4. That's fine. So you, you can have isolated, that's why the last fear, but just from the same, last fear we have more papers coming and I've seen personally that you can have isolated nerve injury and picked up MEP. Isolated nerve injuries or isospawn part injuries are picked up by motors much better by SSP. SSP has been used for a very long time and it's more, but the data is showing that uh, if you have journal spinal cord ischemia or damage to the spinal cord mechanical injury, you can pick up by, the, uh, by SSP. But, but if it is uh, isolated, a single nerve root injury or fiber injury, it's not going to affect your SSP at all. It's going to affect your motor growth potential. So if you have loss of cordyceps, patient will wake up with a hip loss of hip flexor. Patient will not be able to flex their hips for them. So patient says some C5 palsy, so patient can wake so if you're doing ACDF, some C1 to C1, C5 is the most common nerve injured, followed by C2 and then C, uh, C8. So C5, C2 and C8, those are the three most common nerve injured. So you can have change. So if, if you lose your deltoid muscle and you have tricep and hand, doesn't mean your so patient will not be able to shut, move the deltoid for the And trapezius, by the way, is a very bad muscle to monitor because trapezius is Many times we monitor trapezius for C1, C2, C3, <coughs> but, the, but trapezius, C2, C3 uh, nerve roots for the trapezius are more sensory than motor. So the motor root of the trapezius is mostly from the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, the, the nerve root, uh, and it's such a big nerve, it's a big muscle <coughs> in half of your back. So you put in two needles, you're not monitoring, so you cannot tell the rest of the night of the <coughs> Hypoperfusion, so hypo, hypotension, <coughs> talk about hypotension. So, so hypotension is very important. The hypotension for one person will be 16 mean and the other will be 90 mean. It could be 100 mean. So you have to make sure you are monitoring the baseline uh, mean and you are not looking at the uh, just the, So anything of below 80 millimeter as a normal, normal tensor patient, if your mean drop below 80 millimeter, you are at risk of losing your uh, motor mode potential. 860 to 80 is a Risky and low 60 you will definitely lose your MEP. But that's a normal type of patient. Hypoperfusion again, the if you have less than 20 cc uh, per minute per gram, blood flow, you lose your SSCP and MEP. Hypoperfusion uh, is the time to electrical failure, cerebral cortex, it takes 20 seconds. Uh, final gray matter, take one to two minutes. White matter, takes seven to 18 minutes. 
white metal motor with a motor uh, 11 to 17 and peripheral nerve, they have more resistance so they can last for 20 to 45 minutes. But the cortical cortex, so we are, if you're doing EEG, 65, you do uh, clamp the carotid artery, the first 65 changes, percent changes occur in the first 20 seconds. And 80% uh, uh, will occur in the first 60 seconds and 99% in the first 2 minutes. So if you cross the 2 minutes, you know, there's less than 1% chance of having ischemia. So that's the effect of mean on EG, ABR, and SSP. You would get this spikes where you can. Uh, so below uh, six, above 60, you have mild changes. 60 to 70 have moderate changes. And below 60 millimeter, uh, below 50 millimeter mean, it's kind of like severe change in all of them. So this is a, just a few cases. 64 year female patient. Patient is hypertensive and diabetic. Uh, and procedure, procedure number of seizures, baseline. So I have very good slides, so uh, I picked up the worst case scenario, so these are not my best work. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I can show you like the best slide ever, it's like, oh, but when you go to the OR, you'll never see those signals, right? But, you know, like, so you see all the, all the signs, okay, this is SSP or EEG. Sometimes you walk into work and ask him, is it SSP or EEG? So anyway. So this was a one patient, patient mean was 97, you have up left upper row, uh, all signals good. Patient drop mean, post incision, and very slight changes, but not significant changes. 69, so lost all four. This is mean of 69, lost everything. And have, uh, so I have a big discussion with the physiologist, and so have nothing to do with this, but this patient was hypertensive post preoperative so we increase the blood pressure, everything is going from that. Uh, that's changed to 88 and it came back and then it was another patient uh, dropped mean from 94 to 62 this 62 you can see uh, the changes uh, the blue the blue one is the baseline and the red one is the last few traces and the yellow one is so have severe effect in more distal muscles and less effect in the proximal muscle but all the muscles were affected by this Another patient, female, uh, for midline cerebellar tumor, posterior fossa craniotomy, and changes in left upper CCP. Just, this is repositioning, so the position of the arm. So I have changes in the left, median nerve, uh, ulnar nerve SCP, and no change in the right side. Then. So we reposition the arm and the signal came back. Uh, C5, C6 herniated disc, ACDF. <coughs> Again, this is a repositioning arm, so we have a baseline signal and a loss signal on the left side. It came back. Uh, ischemic changes, this was ischemic changes uh, uh, during carotid cases. And this was changed, decrease in amplitude. So, uh, so we can see a gradual decrease. So if it's a gradual decrease, you still have to go up, so you don't wait for 50% drop. So but when you start seeing the change, so this is a, this place, this is dropping, so this is the alert. So something is going on. Do you know any changes in that? Um, I don't know. The old patient. Uh, this is one of the patient uh, paper we published uh, some time ago where it has positioning effect. So this was an ACDF, so I can email you if you want. This was an ACDF patient, <coughs> and the uh, uh, patient was tucked in. It was very obese. Uh, tucked in, patient surgeon went to scrub and lost MEP. Uh, called the surgeon back. He took out the tape, signal didn't come back. So then moved the arm on the arm board and signal came back as his PNMP, which is very difficult for the surgeon to operate with the arm board on the CDF. But this is the pre, uh, before even the seizure. Uh, we also published this uh, here because we reviewed 5,800 cases. And 10 of 4, this is another paper if you want to do about the 10 of 4. Uh, uh, are you doing the right way? So the, doing the correct way, so not just keep stimulating, starting the threshold is very low, so you keep going higher and higher, and people walk in and they, they're stimulating at 100 and you get a train of four, say everything is fine. And especially when you're doing so, you, and you're stimulating the screw, and you're telling the surgeon that the screw is good, you're, if you're not stimulating higher than 10, some surgeons say don't go above 10, some surgeons say don't go 12, some surgeons say don't go above 20, and 20, Million pair with a where ten or four is hundred or seventy will be have very can have a poor outcome. The skin can be in canal and you might notice because you are not even monitoring ninety uh, percent of the vessel. So in case of changes, any changes, uh, uh, the first 
you have to alert the urologist and then alert the surgeon, repeat to determine the cause, repeat the exam. First thing is like repeat again, so that's why you do it. Confirm the exam by ordering the related response. Uh, so compare with left side, loss of left side, compare left and right. Is it the is left or the right? So sometimes the stimulatory switch or the leg switch it can be. There's a paper published, uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, I published a spine journal where the, they were 16 years ago, they were doing an automatic system and automatic system, they were uh, doing MEP, they lost MEP in upper extremity and the surgeon, the, uh, scoliosis, they said, okay, nothing, this upper extremity, they kept going and the patient woke up, they never lost MEP in the lower MEP, uh, the lower limb, the patient woke up, uh, paralyzed most like. And if you look at this, uh, that, and the paper was actually, everyone was upset, we wrote a letter to the editor that why this paper is published, supposedly not, it should not be published. Uh, because you look at the big picture, the f even it take less than five seconds, the latency of hand MEP was longer than the leg MEP. What can cause that? So, oh, yeah. 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 so they lost lower and they thought they lost upper, so they disregarded that. Mm -hmm. So in summary, neuromonitoring plays a significant role in patient protection. Uh, whatever drug are using, they have effects. So not so just make a habit of not just looking at the mean heart pressure and blood pressure and just uh, uh, temperature. So look at the ICP, look at CO2 level, uh, all the factors that can affect because uh, next time you have the surgeon and the CRL will say, I have not changed anything. So those are the different things that will affect your signal. So one of the uh, previous president of ASNM, so one of the code, I like this code, that poor monitoring mm -hmm. is more dangerous to patient safety than no monitoring at all. That's why we provide superior monitoring. And that's why you have to have monitoring versus mapping. So active monitoring versus passive monitoring. Active monitoring is you are monitoring SSP or MEP continuously. Passive monitoring is you do MEP every time the surgeon tells you, or you do SSP every time you active team every 15 minutes. So, uh, so you need to do SAP. I don't stop. I run SAP non-stop because in our case, it takes two to three minutes to average one SSP. And if you lose SSP or you change, you run, you run another one, you take another two to three minutes. So it's already six minute pass. So just doing continuous, it takes five to six minutes to confirm that the change. And if you do after 15 minutes or 10 minutes, you already waited 10 minutes. Then you do the run for two, three minutes, and then you have 13 minutes. And, and you have changes, you say add another three minutes, so that's a permanent change, especially. Thank you. Thank you. Beginning of the case, we have good motors and good SE at that level. But after four or five hours, isn't the gas a lipid? Doesn't it build up in the muscles? So it started out as a half bracket gas. After four or five hours, it's more like a magnet gas. So the, so the when we when we are monitoring the gas, we are monitoring the expired value, not inspired. So you, so you, when your documentation it should always be the expired value. The inspired is always high, so if it is 1.52% inspired, the expired is one, always less than because some gas is absorbed. So, so when you are monitoring the expired value, so you are true. So it's not, it's not going to give you that. It's a one mag in the body, and you are getting half mag on the reading. But uh, the, depending which gas are you using, so comparing the isoprene, isoprene stays in the body for longer time. So over the four five hours, so. You, so it's better to use the desflurane. The best one, I, if I have something like that, I tell them, see, can you use the desflurane? Because if, this is a, if you're using gas and propofol, and if there's a change and you lose the signal, you can turn off desflurane and you get signal very bad. But you can turn off the isoflurane, you take forever to, uh, so to get the signal bad. The propofol on the other side, it accumulates in the muscle <coughs> in the body. So over the longer period, so you 